Alrighty. Um, so yeah, just to, to kind of follow up on what Mike just said, yeah, one, one interesting thing about a lot of this uh, mesh fusion procedural uh, assembly stuff I've been working on is that uh, you know much of it will actually you know transcend uh, mesh fusion and things that you know uh, direct modelers might find useful as well. But anyway, uh, so there were some uh, interesting uh, suggestions and questions that came up uh, when we were looking at the, the one that I'm currently working on, which is this. I call rib trim, which does ribs and frames and tiles and that sort of thing. And 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 one of them was about uh, since one of the methods used is to uh, use the procedural UV transform to wrap these simple uh, 2D patterns, like we see here, around uh, some mesh or some object. Um, was that you know what what if you want to go 360 and, and what if it's a case where you don't have a, a, a natural place for a seam to fall, um, which is the case here where we have this sort of brick-like pattern. And here, uh, as we discussed, as we talked about last week, uh, I'm using, rather than uh, UV transform in this case, I'm using a uh, deformer, use just a simple uh, bend, and uh, just bending it you know, beyond 360 degrees, and therefore that tile pattern, which is with, which is with the uh, offsets there of the rows, can then go all the way around. So, yeah, that's that's my. By the way, as you know, this pattern often gets in the way. One nice thing about the way this thing is set up is that you can pattern doesn't have to be any place in particular. So you can move it off to the side and work on it, and still have a clear view of your model. Um, all right. So um, another uh, thing that came up was. Um, Using falloffs on various parameters of the of the rib trim, and uh, here I'm using a falloff to taper the width of the rib. So you can see they're quite wide here at the bottom, and taper up at the top. So yes, that can be done, and it's a uh, kind of a fun thing to work with since these uh, since the rib width is controlled through the uh, push influence. It's kind of interesting because uh, the falloffs that are available there, at least somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think only texture falloffs can be applied there. Uh, but you know, texture falloffs are nice. They're they're very flexible in the in the sense that you could really have very irregular um, falloff uh, applied to the uh, to the trims here. I mean, to the uh, to the widths, um, or something very orderly like here, because I sim you simply used a gradient, a texture gradient. And and by the way, this sort of sort of touches on uh, other aspects as well. As far as something being you know wrapped all the way around, here we see that as well. This is done with a with a UV uh, transform mesh up. Uh, but here, since we can obviously have a uh, a continuous pattern, we didn't have to worry about doing anything special. And uh, on top of that, um, the another thing that came up is well. Uh, there was this. There was the notion that you're not always going to be able to use the UVs of your of your target mesh of your of of the of the mesh that you want to add these ribs to, and uh, you know this is all set up so that you can use uh, proxies. You know, use simple meshes to to uh, create the uh, UV space on which you want to transform the mesh. And uh, so one of the things I've been working on is a number of uh, procedural um, UV targets. Uh, this one happens to be a capsule, and that's what I'm using to kind of facilitate this wrapping of the rib around the top of the form. Uh, but having, you know, using procedurals for those um, UV transform targets, I think I hope will, you know, will really ease uh, that task. You know, when it when it will when it does fall on on you guys to you know to set up something to get a good uh, UV wrap, it won't be a matter of having to fiddle around too much with a lot of uh, direct modeling to to get the form you want, because most of these things are going to kind of fall into these these categories of you know cylindrical or spherical or or something. But you know we can also go beyond that um, with something like this. So you can see I'm wrapping around this. This is our UV target here, and that's a procedural mesh, and I haven't done anything special to set up controls for it. But we can just go direct to the Procedural ops here, and it's the uh, 
the target here is really just starts out as a cube and then it has some beveled edges and whatnot. So, you know, whatever we could uh, change its height. We could change its uh, bevel size. So yeah, you can see, you know, things like this will help it make it easier to, uh, to fit things. Um, to your geometry. All right, and another thing that came up was um, the notion of curves as opposed to uh, the sort of angular stuff that we see here primarily. And uh, again, I won't show it as uh, we, I did, we talked with Ed a little bit about it, that uh, there is there's gonna be kind of a version of this that supports uh, B splines as a source as opposed to these polygonal patterns. Um, Again, that's all working, it's fine, it just needs some development as a tool. But uh, outside of that, even when you are working with a, uh, a pattern like this, and again, as, as I mentioned uh, last week, you know, the, the, the sort of the first challenge with this is sort of the inverse when you're working with mesh fusion since everything is, gets turned into a, a B spline in order to get uh, angular shapes, uh, you know, something special needed to be done, all these corners get turned into bevels and, uh, you know, we can control the sharpness of the bevel and we looked at all that last week. These are still pretty round, but you know they can be about as sharp as you want. But you can see we also have a, a circle here, and that's because um, this one polygon um, right here um, simply has its corners excluded from that edge beveling that's taking place everywhere else. So when Cat McCart gets a hold of it, it just turns it into a circle. Of course, it's all compressed here because we're wrapping this thing all the way around this box. So the pattern's a bit compressed, but you get the idea. And uh, I think that's about it. Oh yeah, there's just a different version of that with it wrapped around the edges a bit and, and uh, cut all the way through to create a frame. And without the circle that time. And if I might just take another minute here, this is something I'm not going to um, spend too much time on because it's better shown in a different way. Um, oh, by the way, these are a uh, oops, a couple of things I was uh, that came out of my recent experiments with this stuff. Again, you can you can layer these these trims and get some really wonderful complexity in your in your forms, um, and it's just a kick because it's all. You know, it's all live and totally non-destructive and, uh, you know, you can just keep working with it and uh, get all the variants that you want and all that. But that isn't where I wanted to go. Um, what I was going to do is look at the uh, performance enhancement. Uh, I, think it, I think it was last week that uh, Ed asked if uh, anything was happening with multi-threading and I said, no, not really, but there's a kind of important uh, performance enhancement coming along. This is, this is very preliminary, so don't be surprised if something goes wrong. Um, so here's a, a not trivial model. It's kind of silly looking and simple, but um, it has about 34 meshes. And, you know, this is about the point where mesh fusion starts to bog down and you probably might end up using um, deferred updating. But, you know, that's not as satisfying as being able to move elements in real time, and, and especially when you're trying to make fine adjustments. So there's this thing that was really part of that, the new workflow when it, when it came along in uh, 10. Uh, and it's just a, it's an aspect that can be uh, exploited for performance that we just hadn't got around to until recently. Boris has done other performance things, and they all sort of work together now once this one is in place. Uh, to provide some pretty snappy performance in, in many, many cases when you're modeling. won't cover absolutely everything, but cover many cases. So the way mesh fusion has worked up to this point is that when you have a model like this, and it's all one fusion, everything is fused together, um, if I do something like just want to move this mesh, um, oops, I told you something would go wrong. Um, it, it, it 
um, re it refuses the uh, re it re uh, evaluates the entire fusion model. And uh, it's not terribly slow. And the reason I said this is better shown in another context, what I'm going to do is create a little video of this and put it up on the uh, on the 11.2 uh, beta wiki so that you can see it actually in action. But you know, I'm only getting a couple of frames a second here, two or three frames a second as I move this. If we turn on this feature, which is kind of a, a draft work mode kind of feature, um, and this is not the UI, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, and select that same mesh. Well, you notice it actually already happened when I turned on that, that mode. If you look real closely, you'll notice there's no union here. This is just Z buffering. So what, what Mesh Fusion is doing um, is dynamically figuring out what unions can be dropped based on what you've selected. And in this case, um, it's pretty simple. And when I move this now, it's just, it's just perfectly fluid. And you're still getting all the trims. You'll notice it's being trimmed. It has that sort of nice effect there where it's being constrained. It's being constrained both to this big cylinder and to this hole by trims that are, you know, that mimic those surfaces that are just offset from them. So as I move it around, it's still being trimmed, but the union is just being, you know, faked, if you will. And again, it's a work mode um, by uh, the Z buffer. And, you know, if, I, if I'd been, um, Pick a different object. Um, nothing happens right away. You can see that this is still um, has its seams here. But as soon as I start to move it, oops, <laughs> there we go. Uh, I saw this before. Curious. I don't know if it has to do. I'm working in, a, in the advanced viewport, and I don't know if that's if it's related somehow uh, or not. I saw this before. Try that again. Okay. Like I say, Boris just Boris just got this working like you know yesterday or the day before, so quite preliminary. Yeah, there you see it. There was a slight uh, lag when I first started to move it, but then it then it uh, sorted things out, figured out what needed to be uh, what what unions could be dropped, and again, it only drops those that it needs to. Everything else. All of these other scenes uh, remain intact, so you're still getting a pretty good view of your model, but uh, you know you're getting really fluid response. And the great thing about this is, you know, if there were, you know, a hundred more primaries and a hundred more trims here, you'd still essentially get the same performance. The kinds of things it won't handle would be, for example, if you have a big giant trim that's trimming everything. Obviously, there's not much that can be done about that. If you move that trim, it still has to trim everything and, and evaluate all those scenes. But you know, there's so much of this that we do with modeling, especially when we get into complex models, and I certainly experience it all the time, where you know, there's just some little detail you want to work on. And it's just, you know, there's no reason for, for mesh fusion to have to be slow in doing that sort of thing. And it no longer will be. All right, well, that's about it. <laughs>